The RMS Titanic is arguably the most famous ship in history, with its almost romantic and sometimes literally romantic tale of a beautiful vessel revolutionizing naval engineering at launch and tragically sinking on her maiden voyage from a fatal wound by an iceberg. A devastating event that not only held an incredible loss of life but cemented White Star Line in the history books as the company that lost the big one. This is a rather unfair fate for such a wonderful line to be tarnished with, and only rarely are White Star Line's other wonderful ships such as the Oceanic, Homeric, and Teutonic ever mentioned. Her second most famous ship is the ill-fated SS Atlantic, which also sank after striking rocks near Halifax, Nova Scotia. These sinkings are unfortunately seen as just White Star Line incompetence, and although they didn't entirely decimate the line's reputation in their time, they've truly wrecked its legacy. Why not talk about the more legendary liners of the White Star Line, specifically the Olympic class? The RMS Olympic was a monstrous 882-foot-long ocean liner laid down in late 1908 in Harland and Wolf Shipyard. First conceived in the mind of Bruce Ismay of White Star Line, the Olympic was designed as the first in a proposed trio of ships running the Southampton to Cherbourg to New York route, a highly profitable line currently ran by aging White Star vessels such as the Teutonic, which although was stunning on its own, couldn't keep up with the new, bolder liners of the competition. Cunard Line was the chief rival of White Star and had a premier route to New York with the massive and luxurious vessels Lusitania and Mauritania, the latter of which was, at the time, the largest ship in the world. White Star planned on building ships that were tremendously larger than the Cunard vessels, and as soon as the keel of Olympic was laid down, it was obvious that she was going to be. Her construction went off without a hitch through 1909, but they hit a bit of a roadblock when they realized one major question was yet to be answered. What kind of propulsion system was Olympic going to have? In the past, steam reciprocating engines had been used, utilizing steam pressure to move pistons, rotating the propellers. This would suffice, but a new option was now available in the form of revolutionary, literally and metaphorically, steam turbine engines. Cunard had some of these in their Atlantic liners, but they suffered from intense vibration, so White Star wasn't sold on the idea and wanted to test them first. Fortunately, the Dominion Line was constructing two new ships for their Liverpool to Quebec route that would make perfect guinea pigs, the Albany and the Alberta. Dominion Line was owned by the International Mercantile Marine Company, as was White Star, and because White Star was the premier line of the company, they authorized them to seize the two ships. The Albany was renamed Megantic and was fitted with two traditional reciprocating steam engines, as was her sister, but her sister was also given the addition of a third central propeller powered by a steam turbine engine. The line could now test these two ships and compare their speeds to see if the steam turbine engine was worth their time. The Alberta, now named the Laurentic, swam circles around her sister with the new turbine engine, and it was not a hard choice to implement similar rigging to the Olympic. She too would have dual steam reciprocating engines and a smaller central propeller powered by the steam turbine engine. She was launched on October 20th, 1910, and soon to be fitted out with her stylish interiors, completed superstructure, her funnels, and her many other accessories. Initially, she was planned to have three funnels, but for many reasons, including not wanting to be one-upped by their rival Cunard's four funneled ships, they added a fourth for ventilation to the lower decks. In photographs, it's evident that no billowing smoke was coming from the fourth funnel, and if you hadn't noticed that before, you'll now never not see it. Her widely unheard of younger sister, Titanic, was fitted with the same funnel rigging, as was her other sister, the Britannic. Upon completion, Olympic's water displacement was calculated at 52,067 tons, demolishing the rival Cunard ship Mauritania's record of 44,064 tons. Olympic was completed on May 31, 1911, coinciding with the launch of the Titanic the very same day. Olympic departed on her maiden voyage on the 14th of June, 1911, and she sailed quite smoothly with an average speed of 21.7 knots, as expected. At the helm was Captain Edward J. Smith, a White Star Line legend as famous as the line itself. Also aboard was Bruce Ismay, the owner of the line, and the Olympic's architect, Thomas Andrews, the nephew of Lord Perry, the overseer of Harland and Wolfe Shipyard. Upon arrival in New York, large crowds gathered to see the tremendous vessel in all her glory. The New York docks had expected Olympic to be large, but her true size was almost unreasonable. The tugboat L. L. Hollenbach was sucked into the stern of Olympic by her massive propellers and struck the side of her hull. Other than some chip paint, the Olympic was completely unharmed, but the Hollenbach suffered damage to her bow and rudder. 
Olympic was continually compared to her Cunard counterparts following her maiden voyage, and it was noted that she was nowhere near breaking their speed records. It must be noted and emphasized that Olympic was designed with comfort over speed, as White Starline considered chasing the Atlantic speed record a costly and unnecessary tradition. With passenger comfort in mind, Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic all had wide hulls, a design element that limited speed but provided passengers with much larger open spaces and far more accommodations. Olympic's beautiful and notable grand staircase covering seven decks in total was likely the crown jewel of her architecture, and hosted a beautiful blend of Louis XIV plus William and Mary stylings. She was undoubtedly a triumph of naval architecture. Olympic continued along her Atlantic route from Europe to America, but with her enormous size, an incident seemed inevitable. While performing a complex S-turn in the Solent near Portsmouth, a protected cruiser named HMS Hawk came up beside her trying to pass, and as she sped up, Captain Smith slowed Olympic's motors and turned to starboard, which took the Hawk by surprise and resulted in the Hawk trying to turn away quickly, but due to Olympic's water displacement and the jamming of Hawk's steering, the Hawk was sucked in and pierced the hull of Olympic above and below the waterline, flooding two of her compartments. This wasn't a ginormous setback, but it was clear she couldn't continue her scheduled route. Her passengers were cleared off and she was sent to Harland and Wolf Shipyard for repairs. It didn't take long to repair Olympic, but it was valuable time that they lost, and the court naturally took the side of the warship HMS Hawk, prompting even more money lost for White Star Line. After the situation was cleared, the Olympic, now repaired, was sent back into Atlantic service. Interestingly, two passengers aboard the Olympic during the accident, stewardess Violet Jessup and fireman Arthur John Priest, both survived this collision, the sinking of the Titanic and the sinking of the Britannic, both being present for the accidents of all three Olympic liners. Olympic provided lots of room and accommodations for her passengers and boasted a huge carrying capacity, but what she really needed was sisters. White Star needed to match Cunard's Atlantic service with ships more up to Olympic's speed and size. They had planned the construction of the Titanic long before Olympic's launch, and laid down her keel only a few months after the Olympics. After Titanic sea trials, she began her maiden voyage in April of 1912, and White Star now had a premium two-ship Atlantic service. They would never get a third ship on the route, and you'll see why soon enough. Although highly anticipated, the voyage of the Titanic was far less celebrated than that of Olympics. Harland and Wolfe didn't even pay photographers to reshoot the interior of Titanic, and told White Star just to use the Olympics' old photos. To this day, there are no known photographs of Titanic's grand staircase pre-sinking. If any sites claim that this is a photo of the Titanic, keep in mind it is actually of Olympic. As you know, Titanic's story was cut short by Ice Cube, and White Star was back to the drawing board. Only a few months after Titanic's launch in 1911, the keel of the third Olympic-class liner was laid down in the same slipway that the Olympic had been constructed in. This ship was to be the ill-fated Britannic, the supposed pinnacle of the Olympic class. It must be noted that the Olympic and Titanic were functionally the same, but held a few key structural differences between them. Olympic's bridge wings were fixed to the superstructure, while Titanic's were partly over the side. This would be changed when Olympic was altered to match the Titanic's bridge wings in 1913. Olympic's forward A-deck promenade was completely open and exposed, but after White Star realized and went relatively unused by the passengers, they altered Titanic to include more enlarged staterooms, a private promenade, and the Café de Paris where it would have been. Despite these minute changes, the ships were nearly identical, prompting many conspiracy theories about White Star Line sinking the Olympic and replacing it with the Titanic. These theories have little to no backing, so it's best to ignore them. Now, take a gander at Britannic in her completed state. I know what you're thinking, but this isn't how she was supposed to look. Unfortunately, Britannic was completed a year into World War I, and because White Star was a British line, the government requisitioned the Britannic as a hospital ship. Olympic II was requisitioned for service and given her own dazzle paint scheme, and sent to Halifax to be a troop carrier. Thousands of soldiers remained packed like sardines aboard the Olympic. Despite rules being established before the war not to attack hospital ships, naval mines don't discriminate, and Britannic struck one in the Greek archipelago, floundering in 55 minutes. Remarkably, she had few injured soldiers on board, and only had 30 deaths, with 1,030 people surviving. Olympic was once again alone on the Atlantic with no running mate, now being paired with the aging Oceanic for service until Oceanic II was lost in World War I. 
Olympic miraculously survived World War I with only a few close calls, the most significant of which being when the German U-103 attempted to sink her with a torpedo, but struggled to fill the torpedo tubes with seawater, and when she was sighted, it resulted in the Olympic ramming and sinking the ill-fated U-boat. After Cunard's Lusitania had been sunk by the German U-20 in 1916, it was a nice morale boost for Britain. Olympic became notorious along the transatlantic route, especially in Halifax, being nicknamed Old Reliable and continuing carrying Canadians and soon Americans across to Europe. She was briefly pulled to install 6-inch guns on her deck for defense, but they saw minimal use and were taken off after the war. After the treaty was signed that ended the Great War, Olympic was tasked with bringing thousands of soldiers home before she was repainted back to her white star colors and resuming her England to New York route. Despite her success during the war, it had taken its toll on Olympic, and she was running far slower than her pre-war runs. She was extremely tired and needed a tune-up, especially now that she had no sisters afloat. Olympic was given an overhaul in 1919 and then was briefly docked to be refitted with oil-burning engines saving her lots of time from the strenuous coaling process and putting her more up to speed with her competitors. This time through the 1920s was likely her golden years as White Star's largest vessel. She was very popular with the public through the first half of the 1920s, but declined as a liner as time marched on. After a long-winded career, Olympic seemed to be more and more outdated with every new ship, especially now with the new White Star ships such as Majestic. White Star lost some business during the Depression, and after attempting to update Olympic, even painting her notorious grand staircase a deep green, it became fairly obvious that she couldn't be saved and was no longer up with the times. Her once spectacular accommodations now were less than what could be provided on many newer vessels. It didn't help that in May of 1934, Olympic collided with the tiny Nantucket lightship designated to demarcate the edge of the Nantucket Shoals. The Olympic quickly lowered a lifeboat to help, but she killed seven crew members on the now sunken lightship. Although it was foggy and difficult to navigate, it seemed as though there was little excuse for such a negligent incident. It was an embarrassment for the Olympic and the White Star Line. It only added insult to injury when White Star was forcibly merged with Cunard Line, and Cunard led the new merger due to her holding more ships. Cunard scrapped dozens of White Star vessels after the merger, and ultimately they determined that scrapping the aging Olympic was the only thing left to do. They auctioned off her luscious interiors, with many now on display all over the British Isles, notably the White Swan Hotel in England. Olympic began her final voyage with the then-retired captain John Binks, a former captain of the vessel. It was a solemn event, but Cunard White Star held the final trip with much respect and honor for such a historic and beautiful ship. In April of 1935, with a career of nearly 24 years, Olympic was finally broken up. Today, her legacy is often overshadowed by the famed Titanic, and Olympic is unfortunately seen as an afterthought in documentaries, only notably mentioned in conspiracy theory clickbait articles. This is not the legacy she deserves, as the incredible vessel she was, and it's a shame that she holds such little historical notoriety, especially given her involvement in World War I, her long-winded career carrying Europeans to their new lives in America, and her connection to one of the most famous shipping lines in history. Thank you.